Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. This first question is from uh, Himanshu Singh to, uh, to people in the audience that are um, either of Indian origin or have worked with people um, from India, which is pretty much all of people. Um, in India, there are so many engineers in computer science, uh, and there haven't been sort of like big successes like, say, Google or Microsoft that have come out of India in the past. What are the things that you think need to change in order to create large, big successes um, at that scale come out of India? Um, actually, this trend will change, and in fact, um, you know, if you look at the way Indian uh, industry focus is shifting, it, it was, it is actually shifting from the, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to spoke, speak only about the tech industry, so uh, because others I don't know much about, uh, focus, it's shifting focus from IT services sector, which was primarily based on leveraging, you know, human capacity, our ability to be smart programmers, uh, and and do it at a low cost. Uh, to a case where now there is a huge startup scene. You must have read articles uh, recently about the amount of venture fund that's going into cities like Bangalore. Uh, granted, many of it is not exactly for technology innovation, but there is enough of that. I think there are a new generation of companies that are looking at new market opportunities, very much a domestic market, not uh, export-oriented uh, services. Uh, I think this is where the trend will change, and it's entirely up to you. And when you think about your future, rather than thinking about going and working in a big, you know, IT services company, like, uh, you know, the major ones, which I think will give you great jobs and interesting opportunities, think about how you can go out there uh, and, and in the startup scene, how you can now go out there and do, solve a problem or work on something that's more uh, innovation oriented, less services oriented. This is a tendency I think that you'll see grow. My prediction is within the decade, we will see, uh, you know, more than $100 billion worth Indian companies that are in the IT sector. So following on that, in terms of creating new uh, technical capabilities, there are a couple of questions from um, Himanshu Singh, Ajay V, and um, Saurabh Singh that all, um, to you, Professor Reddy, that all sort of talk about um, this whole buzz of wearable computing, um, smart glasses, some have failed, some are still in progress, watches, drones, all these things. What are some of the aspects, given your, your long uh, exposure to how things have changed from vacuum tubes all the way to here, what are some of your thoughts on what aspects need to change in order to turn these into the next, next big thing that will really impact society in a positive way? People. Uh, basically, is this on? Okay. Uh, wearable computers should become invisible computers. They should not be intrusive. Namely, if I'm wearing a camera on my, you know, a pendant or glasses or something, people I'm talking to will be nervous. <laughs> They'll wonder why you're, you know, taping everything <laughs> of your say. So, I think if they're invisible, it turns out you should be nervous now because in Bangalore, every street corner has a camera. So if you're anywhere there, your picture is being taken. So it's not a big deal if I'm taking a picture of you while I'm talking, like my friend Gordon Bell has been trying to do in this, uh, an experiment. But people are, you know, in general, not very comfortable those things. So I think we need to design invisible wearable systems. Uh, if, if they're there, you know, if, if you can't quite do that, I, I, how many of you have seen the movie Her, H-E-R? If you haven't, it's av available on the, on the web. You can download it and watch it. It's, it's bootlegged, uh, so you might, be, you might be doing something illegal, but you know, that's what, what happens in India and China anyway. So, so but uh, if the, what that says is, it probably hasn't been released here. If even it has been released here, most people think it's a nerdy movie, so you don't want to see. It has a very a whole set of lessons 
on how average people, you know, might actually use these things. They, you know, this guy has a camera, the smartphone in his pocket, except he made his pocket short enough so the phone is sticking out. The camera is looking at you. And so there are all kinds of ways these things will happen. So the wearable computers is where it's going to be, whether they're wearable or invisible or on your clothes or whatever, that's a secondary issue. Second, the most important thing is what you saw in the, in the movie, if you think of people and agents helping you to do your job, so you need to think in terms of well, how will all they, they interact, how will they work, what will they do? Ultimately, everything will be specialized. But somehow, as with the specialized agents, you create an ecosystem like the White House or CMO here or PMO, uh, the, the, and they do the work. So that's my view of where, where, wearable computers will go. I was just going to add that one, one more thing that has to happen is that the installation and configuration and management and use of these systems uh, has to be just as transparent and invisible as the systems themselves. These days, you know, I have, uh, like most of you, a, uh, a, a number of digital control systems in my house, but uh, I'm, at, at best, I'm the only person who can deal with it if something goes wrong, and at worst, I can't deal with it either. And, you know, now that it's uh, my music system and my thermostat and uh, a variety of other things, uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, in some sense, a, a, a full-time sysop person at my home. And, this has got to stop. Uh, and, uh, you know, you don't want to be using a stylus or a keyboard. You want to be communicating with your, uh, with your systems in ways that involve voice or gestures or, uh, in the future, honestly, brain-to-computer communication, which is going to happen sooner than any of us think. So this, uh, this notion of I invisibility is not just that things physically fade into your environment, but they have to operationally fade into your environment as well. Just be something that's there and that you don't have to think about, as opposed to rebooting and updating and all of the stuff we deal with today. So there are plenty of opportunities to make things better because they're plenty bad right now. So let me just uh, really quickly again add, um, so uh, there's great work that's going on. You heard from Raj, you know, he's, he's the father in some sense of AI and the kind of things he did, Ed, uh, Jennifer, Chris, they all do a tremendous work in things like machine learning and AI, and they have this concept of what the computer does. Let me tell you what I do. What I do is uh, the plumbing, right? So I sort of work on systems. I try to, the, the, the thing that Raj was complaining about, that the screen goes, you know, I, my job is to make sure that it doesn't go that fast, right? So I think if you look at Google Glass, which was a nice attempt, I think part of the reason it failed is, of course, it was the UI was sort of messed up and wearing it invasive. But more than that, it also didn't provide enough functionality because we actually are not there. We are not there in terms of the energy uh, consumption. We are not there in terms of connectivity. We are not there in terms of processing uh, in being able to provide it. So I think there's a lot of work still left and many years actually left of work to do to get to the point where we can use all these great algorithms that are available in, in computer science and uh, in you know, cloud computing, for example, to be able to bring it to handhelds and variables and things like that. And once we get there, these things will light up. And when they light up, then they will evolve and get better because we will, as we try them out, we will learn what, what, is, what works, what doesn't work, and we'll iterate over it. But I think the systems, frankly, are just not there yet. That's what, and I want to not disagree, but I want to kind of present a different perspective. Let us say we had a perfect Google Glass. And it didn't have any battery problems, it didn't have any memory problems, everything was perfect. I still don't want the distraction of something blaring into my eye all the time of something that it thinks is important. And when I want some, something to be displayed, I want to press it on the wall, and maybe my phone will become a projector. That will be just as good when I want to see it. It must be me, I am in charge, not the Google Glass. That is the difference. That's fine. There's another angle to all this, which is a privacy angle. In fact, so actually, that's a great lead into the next question. From okay, but I just want to say one thing, which is that Victor said he does the plumbing. And I don't want you guys out there to think, ooh, I want to do the theory. I don't want to do the plumbing. Without 
real, deep, innovative changes in what Victor called the plumbing, we are never going to realize the promise of all this theory, the promise of all this data science. The systems that we have today are not properly engineered for the promise of the movie Her. And so those of you who are more hands-on uh, really need to be working very much with the theorists to understand how the plumbing, as Victor said, okay, that is, that is probably the most important piece of the puzzle today. So don't let him put himself or the whole field down, okay? Right, so to, to continue on, on Victor's point, so there's a question from Gautam JM, um, and he touches on many of the things that you guys already mentioned, that with this sort of invisible computing, there are lots of people that are not comfortable with it, there are privacy, there are, there are security issues about all the data that's been collected. So what can you guys talk about sort of the next big grand challenges in this space of security and privacy? And so I'll, I'll start with Victor, then Sriram, and then uh, perhaps even Professor Raj after that. Um, I, since I haven't had a uh, few seconds to think about it, I will just go with my last statement, which I think uh, part of the issue is, um, is privacy is a huge issue. So let me um, uh, take 30 seconds to tell you uh, uh, some of the things that I'm really excited about right now that I'm working on. I mean, besides, I, I do work on connectivity. I work on enabling uh, more and more people uh, to have access to all the information. So bandwidth, delay, energy, all this is good. But what has happened is, as as we try to push the connectivity paradigm deeply, we have sort of realized that, that we need applications that will uh, compel people to, to use them. So one of the areas that I've started to work on is using vision algorithms to believe, believe it or not, and this, we started doing this before all the terrorism and things happened, which is to build wireless surveillance systems. And um, as we build these wireless, and the idea there being that, uh, as was pointed out, Bangalore has cameras, so most cities in the world now have more and more cameras. I just came from London, you've got you know, thousands of cameras in the city, Paris has it as well, but they're all wired and they need power. So uh, my challenge is to sort of make them show that there's no wiring there, and so now the idea is to put computes right at the camera to decide what image is interesting enough to push back into the infrastructure versus not, so that you're not constantly streaming because you just don't have enough bandwidth. Now, even as I do the system and I look at all the vision, what vision people have done and what I can apply and how I can use my systems, I constantly come up with this whole notion of privacy because now I'm taking images or you know, the system's taking images, pictures of people, and people don't like it. And so how do you balance the fact that you're trying to protect and you're trying to do something good and versus you know, engaging in creating the 1984 scenario where you're sort of, you know, knowing I know where you are, I can figure out where you went, I mean, you know, uh, what you're, I mean, I don't want to go into things, but bad things you do. So, so I think technology has a role to play and we have to think through these uh, policy issues, regulation issues, privacy issues quite deeply to be able to enable them to the point where they are useful to us and, but not uh, cause problems for us later on in life. And I think that is a huge challenge for us and I don't think we really know how to solve that one yet. Yeah. yeah, let me add a, um, a couple of things about uh, uh, privacy and security. Um, both are topics that I, I've been working on for the past uh, few years now, um, um, both in the context of um, more sort of data centers and uh, sort of the new kinds of software that people are building. Um, um, in, in terms of privacy, uh, you know, I, I had a good fortune of working with Saikat, who is a real expert in privacy himself, so you should find him. Um, you, you might know that you know all online services, you know, be it Facebook, Bing, Google, they all collect your information. And, uh, and if you go um, look at um, uh, the fine print in those web pages, they offer contracts on what they do with your data and what they don't do with your data. And if you think about um, the programmers that work for these companies that write these programs and wonder whether these programs really respect those contracts that these companies want to um, uh, respect. Um, it's a very difficult thing to do, and the, and the reason why it's very difficult to do is that it's really hard to write programs that do what 
you want them to do because programs get very complicated and it's, it's, it's very hard to ensure that, you know, if maybe if two smart people work on something, you know, you can have some confidence. If you have 500 people or 1,000 people building a system, it's really hard to um, ensure that the system does what you want. So you can actually use systematic techniques to actually check whether um, uh, data that these companies collect really conforms to policy. And that's, that's a very interesting problem. Uh, another problem that's again, you know, it, it came back to verification for me is that the way you sort of think about trust in these kinds of systems is also very, very different, right? When you look at your laptop, um, or, you know, or your desktop, right? The way you keep that machine secure is that you don't download you know, all kinds of you know, software in it. Uh, you put a virus checker in it, and, and you, know, you always you know, download updates and keep it updated and so on. And you build trust ground up, and then you sort of protect your system uh, you know, using a firewall and all of those kinds of things, and then your system is secure. The, you know, even that is not perfect, but that, that's how you think about it, right? But when you think about the cloud, you want to run your code on somebody else's system, and you really don't want to trust that system. But you still want to have trust that the code that you run does what you want. And, and, and people don't, uh, you know, are not spying on you. People are, are not stealing your secrets. And it's an extremely fascinating problem. So if you, have, you know, that's a problem that I've been thinking about for the past couple of years. And I, I know I, I, the solution is too long for me to describe. But it's a very interesting thing to do, right? How do you get trust by running code on somebody's system without trusting their system? You have, you know, it's a very interesting problem. Yeah. So, so I just want to emphasize say something quickly, quickly something that, oh, uh, sorry. that Victor okay, touched on and, and that I would expect Jennifer actually to say, maybe she was about to say it, and that is something important about security and privacy is these are areas where there are no solutions that are purely technological, right? So uh, it's a mix of technological, legal, economic, sociological, and if you're missing any of those components, you're not going to come up with a workable solution. And so. It's one of the great things about this field, that is the opportunity to interact with people in other fields to come up with solutions that really meet people's needs. That's exactly what I was going to say, but he so did it quickly, more eloquently. I think Chris wants to say one thing. I just want to say one thing very, very quickly, because it's a little counterpoint. So um, privacy is very important, but we, we need a balance because uh, an extreme view simply locks down everybody's data. It's a sort of extreme privacy viewpoint. And the point I simply want to make is a bit of a machine learning perspective, in a sense, is that um, there are benefits to making data available. I'll give you a specific example. For the last few years in Microsoft Research, we've been collaborating with the University of Manchester to try to understand the factors which influence the development of asthma in children. And the only reason that we're able to do that research is because 2,000 parents have agreed that data from their children, DNA data, environmental data, and so on, is made available to this study. So they've agreed on behalf of their children to forego privacy of a certain kind under certain controlled conditions in order to make that data available for the benefit of society. And I think we're just scratching the surface. I think if we look at the data from millions of people, including genetic information, including environmental information, disease information, if we can do that while preserving appropriate privacies, then there can be also enormous societal benefits. So I think we have to be wary of positioning ourselves at one end of the spectrum. We need to find the correct balance. Thanks. So, right, so changing track, um, um, the question for you, uh, Professor Lazaska, um, it's convenient that, well, two people, one who didn't write the name, uh, had exactly complimentary question. What would be one, uh, this is about MOOCs, uh, what would be one aspect that you think works fantastic and one aspect that you think needs the most work when it comes to MOOCs. The MOOCs are massively online courseware. So. Right, so this is massively online open courses. And I, I really believe they're transformational. So uh, when I think about the benefits, it's just-in-time learning of a, a great depth, right? You have access to the best courses from the best instructors around the world when you want it, when you're ready for it. Uh, and I think that... Uh, the, 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 that's a, just a really a revolutionary capability, and it brings this level of instruction to people who, for reasons of geography or finance or something like that, uh, wouldn't otherwise have access. Uh, many aspects of MOOCs reinforce things about education that we've known for a long time but don't practice in our classrooms, okay? Uh, and that is that me standing up at the front of the room and talking for 50 minutes is not a very good way for me to teach or for people to learn. The, 
uh, notion that you have small snippets with, uh, with uh, interaction after those snippets that helps you understand whether you've mastered the material, that you can individualize instruction uh, and patterns through curricula for individuals. All of this is great. Uh, he here's my, uh, my two big concerns about it. Uh, one is that there are things that I, I think so far we don't know how to translate into this scalable world. Part of what makes uh, our students desirable to companies like Microsoft is that they have a lot of experience working in teams with mentoring uh, and uh, uh, sort of learning to collaborate and learning to design and build and debug large-scale systems. And uh, this is something that I think we haven't yet figured out how to put online. That is, how do we create the people who are really capable of designing and building novel systems in teams? The other thing is, uh, there, there are in the U.S. and around the world huge disparities in education. And I think some of these will be reduced through MOOCs. That is, education will be available in parts of the world where it's not education, where it's not available now. Part of it is going to get worse, all right? That is, in the U.S., for example, MOOCs are, I think, great for students who are extremely well motivated and lack access. Uh, in the U.S., the problem is uh, less lack of access and I think more lack of preparation and motivation and the sort of home life that makes you a good student. And uh, MOOCs aren't going to help with that. So, Ron, I know we're out of time, but I love MOOCs, right? Don't get me wrong. But I'm drowning in information. I don't have time. So for every course that is there, I would like a one-day version and a one-week version and a full semester version. <laughs> Yeah. So I, I want to uh, put in a quick plug. In the afternoon, after lunch, we actually have a talk which is very related to this question. It's called Mech, Massively Empowered Classroom. So please come and hear what we are doing to make learning, online learning, more accessible and more effective in India. And one last question in the remaining minus one minute. Uh, and this is, this is to you, Chandu. Um, what's the one next big thing MSR has planned for India and whom are they focusing on? Ah, that's actually two questions. Uh, let me deal with the focus. There's an old saying in uh, computer science that you don't build a bridge by looking at the guys who are swimming across the river. So targeting is a little dangerous. Uh, but let me take this time to tell you how we actually do projects in Microsoft India. The best thing we have, the greatest asset we have are our people. So we hire the very best minds we can find, and we let them do curiosity-based research. So it's not about directing research, it's about directing, getting the right talent on board. So what is the next big thing come? I don't know, if I did, you know, I would not be here, perhaps. You know, I might be Bill Gates next time. That's not how research is done. We pursue ideas based on our best uh, guest, on what would be important. And some of them pan out, some of them don't pan out. But we reinvigorate ourselves and try more. So I don't really have a question, answer to your question directly. Um, are we targeting people? Yes, absolutely. We are targeting every user of a, of a computer. That is what we do. We are also talking about targeting people who don't have access to computers like m many of us do. Um, we target societal projects that have a societal impact. We target projects that can have a significant bearing on, on life in India and in other parts of the world. So I actually want to um, you know, follow up to Chandu's comment, which is uh, rather than looking at us or MSR or whatever for the next big thing, here's an opportunity. If you, uh, you know, uh, focus on research, learn the subject and become an expert, you could be the inventing the next big thing. So I would rather encourage you to do that then we're looking for the answer from us. And that's really sort of being a reason. I think that's a perfect note to uh, end this Q&A session on. Thank you so much for the panelists. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors and leading academics and makes videos of these lectures freely available.